Good afternoon, everyone. Maribel here from TELUS World of Science, Edmonton. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Pro Professor Caulfield, uh, who's the Canada Research Chair in Health, Law and Policy at the University of Alberta, has published numerous science popularization books in addition to TV shows. Thank you so much for being here with me today, Professor Caulfield. Well, oh, thanks for having me on. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your current research. Uh, you're involved in mapping and countering coronavirus misinformation. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? There is so much misinformation right now uh, about COVID-19. It's, it's really incredible. And this misinformation is everywhere. Um, so we wanted to, to, to uh, have a project that tried to get a sense of where that misinformation is coming from. Um, so we're looking at the news media, we're looking at social media, which is a huge source of misinformation, by the way. And we're also looking at, at search engines. So how, you know, when you search for something, what, what pops up? Are you getting accurate information? So we're doing empirical research on that. But then we're also trying to do empirical research on how people respond to that information. So Gordon Pennycook, he's leading that arm of the project. He's at the University of Regina doing really cool cutting edge research on on you know who who believes this stuff how are they responding to it and then of course what we want to do is we want to bring it all together and come up with recommendations so we want to do this near term this is a now problem right so we want to be able to inform not just the scientific community and research institutions but the public too you know how can they how can they help in, uh, in the fight against misinformation so we're we're trying to do all of that <laughs> that sounds like a lot. And as you said, you know, one of the big issues with coronavirus are things are changing so quickly. When you look at the timelines, you know, this basically started you know, at end of 2019. I know it feels like 10 years ago. <laughs> um, and that has, seems to have been an issue in terms of, um, you know, what you hear one week from public health officials, be it about masks or closing borders, changes from week to week. Um, how, how, can we properly communicate, you know, how science works um, so that it doesn't look like people are changing their minds and um, it doesn't look like if there's misinformation happening around that? Yeah, that that's, a, that's a great question because um, I think it's one of the challenges. The science is still evolving. Uh, the science is still emerging. There's so much uncertainty out there. And you want pub the public health authorities, you want these science-based institutions to be nimble. You want them to respond to the science as it emerges. And that's one of the reasons it's so important to go to those trusted voices, you know, these voices that are aggregating the science. So I think this is a really interesting science, science literacy question. You know, science is not a list of facts. And if one of those facts is wrong, science isn't wrong. You know, that's not the way science works. This is an opportunity to tell people science is a process. Science is always evolving. And you want those those policy entities that are relying on science to be nimble. So when we hear more research on masks, when we hear more research on, on social distancing, we want the rules to change. That's exactly what you want to have happened, especially at a time now where we're, we're still getting the good data in, we're still, we're still sort of responding to the science. Oh, that's, a, that's a really great point. And I think the, the issue of science literacy is key. Um, as you say, thing, things are involving. This is a, a incredibly complex situation. Um, so it doesn't mean that they were wrong before. They're just reacting to to what we know at a certain point. Uh, that's right. Uh, you know, on the contrary, they weren't wrong before, right? Uh, and uh, they could they could have been one hundred percent correct given the available body of evidence. This is the right decision. Um, it, it's like arguing that a uh, a, a a fortune teller. Uh, you know, is is correct uh, because she guessed something right uh, in January. That doesn't make fortune telling right and science wrong, right? It, you want to be able to have, be nimble and and respect the scientific process. Mm -hmm. Wow, that that's a really important message. Thank you. Um, in terms of misinformation, um, and this is one that we're hearing, you know leaders of different countries. Uh, Emmanuel Macron yesterday was talking about hydroxychloroquine. Donald Trump, of course, has been touting it as an effective remedy for, for weeks now. 
um, what what should the message around that be? Um, and and what is what is the problem um, at this stage with looking for remedies and and um, telling the public about remedies from those platforms? The whole the whole way that the this has played out with this drug has been incredibly frustrating. Um, I think this we should let's again view this as an opportunity to talk about um, how you need good science to make decisions. So much of, of this discussion came from a small French study that was not randomized, that was not a good representation of the general public, uh, very preliminary data. And from that, this broad international discussion has emerged. Uh, we need to wait till we have good clinical uh, research to back it up. But so this is a really good example of, of why you need to wait for good research because you know, anecdotes, small studies, you know, non-randomized studies, that's not what you want to inform, use to inform uh, your policies. And the other really important thing to remember, it's another opportunity to talk about how difficult it is to do good science. Um, did you know that 90%, 90% of, of drugs that are already in a clinical trial, so they've made it through basic research, they made it through an animal study, maybe some preliminary research, now they're in a, now they're in a clinical trial. 90% of those don't make it to the clinic. Right, so failure is the norm, right? And even the ones that make it to the clinic are usually not as efficacious as they previously hoped, right? The, this idea that there are these breakthrough drugs that are being held up by a bureaucracy is just false. You know, a truly groundbreaking breakthrough gr drugs that that alter alter the landscape are are vanishingly rare right and and so i think this is a good opportunity to educate the public on that fact right you really do have to be patient with science it's an iterative process it's fun to watch it unfold use your curiosity to see it unfold but but be realistic and, and don't have false expectations so that brings that you know that's a complicated balance right because what what i'm hearing is obviously you know, policy needs to be made when we're faced with a pandemic like this, uh, where initially, you know, masks were not recommended, um, and now they are. Um, whereas, you know, we're we're starting to do some trials on, um, as you mentioned, uh, you know, in France there was a small trial that was made. Um, so, so some some reaction. Science needs to inform policy quickly um, and potentially backtrack. But for things like vaccines, like drugs, um, you can't just respond as quickly. Is, is that kind of what I'm hearing? That the the consequences there are, are completely different. Uh, uh, that's right. You have to you have to balance all of these these factors, right? So the masks are a really interesting and complex story, right? Because the data still is not very clear about their usefulness. So that's why the World Health Organization still does not recommend it, why some other jurisdictions still don't recommend the use of masks. But that's why my, I always recommend, follow your what your public health authority in your region recommends, right? We need to be kind of in this together and they're doing their best to make a recommendation Given the available evidence, given what's going on in their region, given public expectations, uh, um, what is best? With, with the drug approvals, think about the harm that would happen, for example, uh, if they circulated a test that didn't work or didn't even work well, right? It would do more harm than good. Um, think about the harm that would happen if you used a drug that didn't work. Now, keep in mind, this drug that we're talking about has real side effects, you know, serious side effects, you know, um, and in fact, some trials have been stopped in the United States because they're so concerned about the side effects. This is not some benign thing that only has upsides. There are downsides that need to be weighed. So you're exactly right. You know, you have to consider the science, you have to consider uh, behavioral responses, you have to uh, consider what the public expectations are. It's a comp these are complicated questions. And, and especially at a time where it's uncertain, I think it's best to to, to you know, defer to these these interdisciplinary groups that are trying to do their best to come up with an answer for your population. Mm -hmm. So one last question, talking about all these experts. Um, in the past years, we've unfortunately seen a bit of an erosion in public trust uh, in science um, with you know, fake news. And now within this current pandemic context, we're, we're seeing, you know, 
Dr. Fauci, Dr. Hinshaw, Dr. Tan become household names, uh, seeing a great response from the public and how, you know, they, um, er, er, all, all Canadians within the last study were saying how, you know, the, the scientists and, and the doctors should be the ones informing public health policy. Do you think that one positive outcome of this coronavirus um, pandemic might be that there might be a renewed engagement and trust in science? I hope so. <laughs> you know, that's my here I am praying. <laughs> I hope, I hope that that is one of the legacies of this crisis, uh, the, a a growing embrace of science, a recognition of the value of good science, but also trustworthy science. Right, having science that is independent, that people can turn to and feel and feel that they really can believe in. So I I, I hope I hope that that ha happens. I also hope there's a growing recognition of of the downside of misinformation and pseudoscience, right? You know, we've I think we've tolerated pseudoscience for far too long. So I hope that that's another legacy of this. You know, if you look at this, the research that's coming out, a study came out just this week that found that 86% of Canadians think that policymakers should be basing their decisions on science. And, and I love that. So let's, let's try to keep that, you know, go science momentum uh, after this this crisis has has passed, uh, so we can make sure that we're better prepared for the next one. I would uh, I would love that. I I also <laughs> yeah. hope that, that, is, that is one of the outcomes. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor uh, Professor Cowfield, for for taking the time to to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. Mirabel Primal Schwartz here from Talus World of Science, Edmonton. Um, any questions, any comments, please feel free to, to write uh, using the hashtag my2z. Thanks again.